Basically, talent is spread equally across the world, but opportunity is this philosophy of a global workforce, not outsourcing, not assistance, just like genuinely, you name it. If it can be done remotely, it can be done globally. You can't just throw a body at a problem. If you just throw a body at a problem, you might make it worse. You're gonna waste a bunch of time and money. When I think about leading and managing people, I need to be crystal clear on standards or else I can't hold them accountable. And when I think about what the role, there's two roles of a leader, right? Get the job done and retain your people. That's it. I think it's very common for all of us who try to be somewhat enlightened leaders to say, no, I'm different. But the fact is you've got a big sign on your forehead that says, I'm the boss, I'm the gray beard. The reason we own and build businesses is so that they serve us. We don't serve them. What's the scuttlebutt? So what is the scuttlebutt? Anybody hear anything? Scuttlebutt! The definition of that word is a rumor or gossip. Hello, and welcome to the Scuttlebutt Podcast. Normally on this show, I interview veteran business owners, entrepreneurs, and operators on the tactics they're using to build their business. Today, I've got something a little different for you, though. Outside of the podcast, I lead peer groups for these same veteran entrepreneurs. I bring in expert speakers to break down specific topics. Recently, I brought in John Matzner. John is former Department of State and the co-founder of Sagan Passport, a global talent agency that's paid on subscription rather than a per-head hire. In this discussion, John will teach four different things, how and where to find top talent outside of the United States, how to be a more effective leader when onboarding new employees, the benefits outside of cost savings that you get from hiring global, and how to find what roles you should look to hire for first. If you've ever hired an overseas VA that didn't work out, considered hiring outside the United States, but are nervous to have employees or are going to need employees sometime soon, you're gonna walk away from this conversation with something tangible to implement in your business today. You can get these four highlights from John in written format, as well as other weekly case studies and tactics at scuttlebuttpodcast.co. Nice to meet everybody. My name is John Matzner. I am currently based in San Diego, California. I am a, I guess you would call me an entrepreneur, but that's a silly word. I've bought and sold a bunch of businesses. I've grown some. I've had a lot of fun doing that. Previous to that, I was works for the federal government within the national security community. I was like in the State Department, and I'll let you figure out what that means. But I spent my time in South America, North Africa, and the Middle East. They taught me Arabic, mostly doing counterterrorism and counterproliferation work. So worked very closely with y'all in the military and had a lot of fun and lots of good stories to talk about over a beer that I'm sure you all have as well. So that's my, that's my professional background. Did you have anything you want to add on that, Brock, or no? No, that's good. Maybe want to talk about maybe like a brief intro to Sagan Passport, and then we can I can give you some limits from there. Cool. Okay. I'll just do the quick and dirty. I have built and grown a bunch of companies of various sizes and various geographic scope. And over the course of building, buying them and building them, I came to a realization that all of you, almost everyone here has been deployed overseas. I'm guessing. Yeah. I'm going to say something that it's the most uncontroversial statement, but that people don't think about. There are very smart people who happen to live in other countries. It's like the most obvious thing ever. But if you look at the way that most businesses are run, that is not how they're thought about. So you guys, I'm sure if you worked with an interpreter and you're like, dude, Haji knows everything. Like, dude, smarter than I am. Or like, guy has a PhD. He was a chemical engineer. Or like, they're... Basically, talent is spread equally across the world, but opportunity isn't. So I'll say that again. Talent is spread equally across the world and opportunity isn't. And in my professional career working and living abroad, I came to appreciate, I want these people to come help me build my companies. They're great. And because of the magic of the internet and the, the magic, internet and the magic, I can now unlock a global talent pool that helps me build awesome companies, give my customers better experience, source more business acquisitions, provide better customer service, you name it. And this isn't some like backwater, like somebody in the Philippines who's really got a headset on in some call center. It's just like this great person who happens to just be in another country, who works for me directly, who's just a member of my team. Just like they were in Fort Lauderdale. They just happened to be in Mexico City or in Ireland or in Manila or in 
whatever. And so because of the magic of the internet, I have been very successful and now I have a company that helps people do this. Let business owners, operators, managers, salespeople, whatever, help them build a global workforce directly, not through an agency or anything like that, because there's great people who live all around the world. Now, as a second benefit of it, you happen to save money, but that is not what it's about. You happen to save money. It's about getting great people because as somebody who's owned and built businesses in Southern California, I struggled to get high quality people that I could afford. I just struggled. It was just a nightmare. Like it was just tough. But by simply making the position global, I wasn't outsourcing. I wasn't using an agency or a VA. I was just like, that's Steve. He happens to live in a country where the cost of living is lower. So I can give him a great job directly. And he's happy as a clam. I'm happy as a clam because I finally get my phone answered, which was a nightmare to do in Southern California or get my accounting done successfully for a price I can afford. Or, and it wasn't about saving money. It was about getting great people. That's what it, it was just like, I want great people. I can't afford a great person in California for $180,000 a year. I just can't do it. I don't have the money. And so I've basically, because of my background, I've gotten really good at it. I love working with business owners to do it. Just this philosophy of a global workforce, not outsourcing, not assistance, just like genuinely, you name it. If it can be done remotely, it can be done globally. And there are just wonderful people. There are 9 billion people outside the US. I love working with Americans. I love working with non-Americans, right? It's not one's better than the, they're all great in their own different, unique ways. Had a lot of success doing that. Love talking to, about, lo talking to people about it. It's the magic of the internet. This is all because of the magic of the internet. So I think your first statement about, but it's not controversial about smart people being outside of the, the United States. Funny that you say that because there is a lot of stigmas around like hiring an outsource VA or like doing this. And we, there's myriad different experiences that people have had from hiring, maybe self-hiring, maybe going through some kind of agency. I know you've got your own opinions about all the different agencies that kind of upcharge and like mark, mark up labor like crazy for really nothing. You've got a different model than that. We can talk about that later, but I would love for you to maybe, I know several people on this call there have had executive assistants outsource or like global VAs before maybe have had bad experiences. I'd love for you maybe to start off with talking about what would be, what are like systems, SOPs, processes? How are you thinking about bringing somebody on? fully acknowledging that if somebody is not successful, when we hire somebody, it's largely our fault. Like we have not either didn't screen them. We didn't verify that they have the right skills. We didn't have a good job description. We didn't have any. So maybe start off with talking about that and we can go from there. Are there any Marines on the line? Okay. So Juan will appreciate this. I believe in my core that almost everything ends up being a leadership issue. It's a leadership issue, meaning if you're not a good leader who's clear, who gives a task purpose end state, who gives clear expectations, doesn't matter how good or bad the person is, they're going to struggle. And very often what happens with assistants is you hire, Chris hires an assistant because he's so busy, but he forgets that this person is sitting on the other side of the world and doesn't take the time to know what, to, to do what he knows is true, which is, hey, here's some context. Here's some situational awareness here. He's just, I don't know, answer all my emails and rah, I'm busy because he hired an assistant because he's so busy, but then he forgets he or she has no stinking clue what's going on. And so it's stuff that we all know because we've all led people before, but things like, hey, Juan, welcome to the team. Our mission here is to provide HVAC service to the greater St. Louis area. The way we do that is by bang. Do you have any questions, Juan? You forget to do stuff like that. You're just like, I don't know, I'm really busy. Go pay the accounts receivable. And so very often, I believe a lot of this ends up being leadership stuff, basic leadership stuff. Obviously, if you have somebody who's a butthead, that's not leadership, like a pure butthead. But like very often, the same person with a good leader versus a bad leader has a completely different trajectory. So I often believe it's SOPs are great. I love writing stuff down, love all the fancy technology, but you all know it. You have the best technology in the world. You have bad leadership and bad people. 
you're losing, right? But you could have the most basic technology in the world, but you're, you have a good leader, a good manager, good senior NCOs, you're going to crush it. And so that's what I mean is I think a lot of times people forget what they already know, especially you all in this group, being a, what a good leader is, right? It's, you, you know it. You've done it your whole careers in a variety of forms. I would just, generally speaking, I bang the leadership gong a lot or the management gong a lot. Have you told them what a good job looks like? Have you set the standard? Have you told them that they're expected to pick up the phone within two rings? Or are you guessing? Just basic good leadership stuff that you all know, given your background and your training, but very often you forget it the minute you hire somebody globally. Why do you think that is an issue with global talent versus somebody's walking into your office, you interview them and like, why would the expectations be different? Because I think that you're hitting the nail on the head. Almost like you just expect that they know, even though somebody globally from another country probably will require more management leadership nuance to what you're doing. Why, why do you think that is? I think it is the challenges that we've all had. And looks like there's been some guys here who have maybe been a few laps around the sun, right? Which is when you're sitting in the same room as someone, you can get away with more. Just because they lean back and they go, hey, Ron, what zip codes do we service? And Ron goes, oh, we don't do that part of the city. And then it's done, right? But if that person is on the other end of a computer in a remote work environment, whether they're American or not, now that needs to be a meeting. Now that needs to be an email. They can't just lean back and yell, hey, Ron, do we do dishwasher? No, we don't do that. All right. Meaning remote work magnifies good or bad leadership or management. And so you just have to be a little bit better. And again, that's American or non-American. If you're working with somebody in a distributed environment, it's just, it makes good leaders great and bad leaders worse. And so I think a lot of the function of it is because of remote work. It's not global work. And the second thing I'd say is oftentimes the first reason people hire globally is because they're so busy, right? They're just, I'm, I get a hundred emails a day. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And then they just forget that it gets harder before it gets easier. Meaning you have to develop, you have to show this person what the heck is going on. You can't just like push them in the deep end and be like, swim. And so you get busier before you get less busy because you got to teach somebody. It takes you five seconds to answer that email, but now you have to do that forever versus if you take a minute and teach them how to answer it, you don't have to do it ever again. Teach a man to fish stuff. So I think it, a lot of it comes from the reason oftentimes why people hire people is because they're so busy but then they forget they need to set this person up for success. You can't just throw a body at a problem, right? If you just throw a body at a problem, you might make it worse. You're gonna waste a bunch of time and money. So that's how I think about it is you gotta like, you gotta pay the price in terms of developing your people so that you can then take advantage of their autonomy or their, those kinds of things. What kinds of things are you thinking about when it comes to I don't know if there's maybe you have a checklist or is there a process that you're like, hey, I need to, I'm, maybe it actually starts with, I want to hire somebody for XX role, but what are those like precursor conversations you're maybe either needing to have with yourself and or writing down prior to, do you have something like that for yourself? It's like, I need all of these things done before I can hire somebody. Generally speaking for me, it's pretty simple. You just need to define what outputs or what end states you're going to hold them accountable to. That's it. So it's not like I'm so busy, I need an admin assistant. That's very poorly defined. It's I need someone to respond to my emails within an hour. I need someone to pick up the phone within three rings. And I need someone to keep CRM organized. I need to hire a graphic designer. Okay, I need someone to make six social media graphics a day. You, basically clarity of expectation, end state, right? What's the end state here? What's the end state? What's the end state? What's the end state? You don't just hire a body and then guess, right? So we work globally. You can have everybody from CFOs to video editors to bookkeepers. It's not just low level stuff. It's everything. Sales reps, marketers, ops folks. I just hired somebody for a private equity firm who's doing financial modeling to do uh, leveraged buyouts full time. So I just mean, the point is, is that it's just clarity. It's leadership stuff. Like why is Brock here? End state. 
a community where veterans can talk about small business issues. Okay, you've defined the end state. Now we can go improvisational jazz how we get there. So I think clarity on end states, if you're looking to make a hire, by the way, this applies for any hire, not just globally. If you're looking to hire someone, it's like, why am I hiring this person? What end state am I trying to achieve? I want to close the books within five days. Good one. So I need an accountant or a bookkeeper or a controller. So I think it's mostly end states, Brock. It's anything beyond that. As long as you're clear on expectations, end states, and maybe standards, set the standard. Hey, here's what a good job looks like. Off you go. People will surprise you. What you just said of this doesn't necessarily impact just global stuff is like half of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation because these are not issues specific to just hiring like that. These are if you hire uh, somebody remotely here or even if somebody is in the office, but they work part time remote for you, like these are all things that you have to have figured out. And like you said, for the reasons you said before, maybe they're more obvious when you meet in person, but we will glance over them in a global or remote context, actually. I think it's important just maybe for some of the guys, just so that you guys know that I'm not like some like new age person, right? Or this only applies to like weird stuff. I bought a home improvement company in Southern California that was doing about a half a million dollars a year in sales. Within 36 months, we're doing over $10 million a year in sales. And I had in-house W2 crews, 1099 sales reps, and every other person on the team was global. 100%. When our crews came in the morning, they came in and there was a computer screen with my crew manager on it and they would hit print and the printer would print out their jobs for the day because I had so much trouble getting reliable labor in Southern California. And this is a construction business. So it's not just like internet stuff, right? Like a global workforce applies. And I just want to say that to you guys. It's not, oh, it's only like new stuff. I've done this with vets, architects, private equity companies, franchisors, plumbers. I own a bunch of auto shops, right? Other than being a mechanic who's physically working on the car, there's no reason to have somebody sitting there doing your accounts receivable. It can be global. And you can pay your, you can pay your auto mechanic more now. Steal them from the shop down the road because you pay them $6 an hour more. So I just, as you guys think about this method, it's not just like fancy internet companies and, oh, I'm in a WeWork. Like I build real brick and mortar companies, hard ones, not just like internet, new age. I do that too, but I just mean, it's a broadly applicable methodology, not just like website stuff or something. So. I, I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Because uh, I could see if you're listening to this, you're like, oh, that works and that. I'm like, I've done it in pet cremation, like the most random things you thought of, right? So yeah, me directly, I've helped people who do that. I've never, I would never own a pet cremation business, but. What to are... answer? Oh, hey, Brock, are we going to get a answer questions or is this ask yeah, questions? Yeah, yeah. Or is this, Sorry. This oh, okay. I just am, uh, I'm just leading the, leading the thing here. Go for it. Okay. Hey, so John, I fully buy on their smart people all over the world and labor arbitrage is a great thing. And it's very possible to manage remote employees. What I struggle with, I am one, I, I don't know if I'm the new age company, but my company is largely web-based in finance and we move large six digit sums of money fairly frequently and we deal with a lot of you know, like a, personal a title information and, title and trust company ask like what type of stuff we're, we're a, a finance we raise capital for for agribusinesses and so we got a lot of privacy information socials stuff like that my concerns with remote employees with oconus employees are money movements and trusting them. I know if even my remote employees in the U.S., I know that I can always call the cops on them or come bust their kneecaps. One of the two, if they try to rip off from the company, I ha I don't have that leverage with the, with the foreign employee, uh, to my knowledge. What, how do you get around that? Or is there a yep. way to get? Yep. Great question. Basically IT security. And you are correct in saying a lot of these issues exist with remote U.S. employees too, but you don't have the benefit of the U.S. court system. Broadly speaking, the way that I would think about it, Chris, and what I've done very successfully is one of my favorite analogies for how to use global talent is right now you have a lot of Gordon Ramsay's, but you need some prep cooks and dishwashers. Meaning the guys who hit send on the $50,000 wire, I would let even my business partner do that stuff. Like 
I'm doing that, right? Never an outbound wire or adding a payee in QuickBooks Online. That's me. That's me or my CFO and I know his kids, right? But there is so much more work that goes into you producing your work product than just hitting send on the wire, right? Meaning categorizing expenses, acquiring new customers, scheduling kickoff calls with new clients, creating the CIM for a new offering, right? That doesn't involve you taking exorbitant IT security risk. There are ways to manage it, but for the purposes of you, I would look at chunks of your businesses that I would call non-sensitive, like putting together a CIM. Hire a writer, a graphic designer, and now they're not hitting outbound, out execute on the wire. I would like, I don't trust any, I don't trust Americans to do that. But you are having a lot of your work done, like putting together the data room for a new deal. Okay, there's no sense. That's a something off MLS. We took some pictures. They coordinated with the on-site photographer. We took the transcript from the Zoom meeting and we put that in and we wrote the CIM and now we make CIMs way faster and easier. So I would just, I would redefine what the outputs of your work are and the sensitive stuff. It's not all one or all the other. So I just keep them away from this, especially in the beginning. That's long answer to a short question, Chris. I love the sound of my own voice. That's helpful. There's probably <laughs> some processes we could figure out how to divest from the, the core people that own them. That's, and very often, again, what I, the way I think about this is for any of you who are economic students, this is Adam Smith division of labor stuff. If you read your wealth of nations in college or high school, all this is Gordon Ramsay makes $250,000 a year. Do you want that guy peeling potatoes? Do you want that guy searing a hamburger, which is with a recipe that's above the grill? Do you want that magician? searing a hamburger. You want that guy doing magic stuff, right? And so as you think about how roles and work is defined in your company, Chris, instead of saying, I just need more Gordon Ramsay's, think I need to look at what Gordon Ramsay does and I'm going to have a, kid, a teenager come in at four in the morning and he peels all the potatoes so that when Gordon walks up, he can just do magic stuff. So I would encourage you to think about role design and just saying, are my magical people doing magical shit? I can curse because you guys are veteran guys. <laughs> I want magical people doing magical shit, right? I don't want the, I wrote a, a newsletter called Fighter Pilots Don't Cook the Pancakes. What do they do? They fly the jets, right? And what's the cook do? He cooks. And what you don't ask the admiral to cook the pancakes. But in a lot of businesses, you have this big sales rep and he's supposed to be making 100,000 plus a year and he's inputting data. He's peeling potatoes. So I would encourage you, Chris, as you look at your business to look where your big, your pipe hitters are and have them do pipe hitter stuff and then have your middle people do middle people stuff and have your junior guys do the junior stuff or your inexpensive folks do the inexpensive stuff. Because a lot of times it's just like, I need more fighter pilots. It's, yeah, because you're having your fighter pilots cook the pancakes. So it's a kind of chaotic analogy, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Anybody else got any questions? I'll keep rolling, but as Chris so graciously interrupted me. <laughs> Throw something at the screen if I get on a roll and you want to ask the questions. Like, yeah, just smack the camera or something. I'll probably notice. I'll jump in here with another one and maybe this will spark some thought. The, as you've talked about outlying before, Chris, we were talking about expectations. Hey, this is what the end state of what this person hired is going to be responsible for. How do you think about managing are you putting all of that in like a Word document and providing that to them? How are you thinking about giving company documentation, expectations, outlining all of that stuff for employees, whether they be global or not? I know that you are, you're a big uh, documentation guy, so. The reason why I like documenting is it's, a, it's setting the standard in written form. So if I have a mentorship session with Juan, and we are get on Zoom or we're in person and we talk. And then two weeks later, Juan Fs up. I go, Juan, what's up, man? And you're like, I thought you said this. I'm like, I didn't say that. Now it's he said, she said. Right? There's no standard. But if I go every morning at 7 a.m., you will peel the potatoes, potatoes this way. Here's a picture of a peeled potato. 
here's an arrow pointing to where you put them when you're done. Juan, I'll be back tomorrow to see how you've done. And Juan wets the bed and drops the ball. He gets one morning and then he gets fired. I've set the standard. Here's what good looks like. And when I think about leading and managing people, I need to be crystal clear on standards or else I can't hold them accountable. So if I just have a conversation about what a peeled potato looks like and Juan messes up, I'm back where I started. Juan, I told you, I thought you said you want. God, man, that sounds like brain damage. I take a picture. I put some nice little arrows on it. I go, this is where the potatoes go. Here's what a good potato looks like. Questions. Okay, if you drop the ball on this, one morning and then you're done, Juan, because peeling potatoes ain't that hard, right? But if we're just having meetings and chit-chatting about it, there's no standard. What's the standard? How do I coach if I don't have a standard? How do I hold accountable if I don't have a standard? How does Juan succeed if he doesn't know what the standard is? So to me, it's about clarity of expectation. And that's why I'm obsessed with writing things down. I'm obsessed with writing things down as I build my companies. Because now I can be like, Chris, did you get a copy of this? No, I didn't get a copy. Okay, here's a copy. Chris, do you see bullet point four? Can you read it back to me, Chris? Potatoes should be ready by 7 a.m. Chris, it's 8 a.m. Do you see the potatoes? Let's talk about timeliness. And now I've got something to do. Now I can coach Chris and see if he's a wanker or not. But if I don't write it down, again, global or non-global, I've got no ability to, you know, now I'm just herding cats all day. Now I'm just herding cats. Do you guys, does anybody here write stuff down in their business? S playbooks, SOPs, operating manuals, that kind of stuff. I'm obsessed with it. Yeah, I can. I was just laughing to myself uh, because I'm taking notes right now, literally uh, right here. Yeah. And uh, also my screen might be blanking out a second. And also I always keep notes. I send emails to myself from two separate email accounts just because I get the, you look at the, you see the path. Need is go down the road and you keep going. And sometimes you forget to look left or right, like a horse, the blinders. And then you just, what I'm looking at the front. Yeah. You're looking at journals and everything. It helps me. Love that. Yeah. So, y'all that have built or run businesses before, you guys also, I imagine, believe in writing things down, right? Like, I just, I love it. I'm obsessed with, even if I talk to somebody live, I'll send them the minutes afterwards. Hey, as discussed, Mike. You've had an issue with tardiness. Let's not be tardy. Let me know if you need any support or resources from me. Tardiness is important in our company. And now there's a written record of it. And when they wet the bed, Habibi, right? Instead of us farting around. That's why I love writing stuff down, man. It's because I can hold people, myself accountable, my peers accountable, vendors accountable. Written record. It's what's the old phrase like, the faintest ink is better than the strongest memory. I don't remember half the crap I say. <laughs> you remember that banger of a, a quote though. So <laughs> I've had a lot of head injuries over the years. So every now and then the neutrons connect correctly and uh, <laughs> something comes out, but it's completely random. So cool. Yeah. Brock, what else? Obviously I love talking about this stuff. How about let's talk in cohesion. Uh, you've got a global, let's imagine somebody has got a global and or just even a remote workforce. How are you thinking about building that kind of team, a unity? You've got language barriers, you've got time zone barriers, you've got all sorts of different things you get thrown at that are layered on top of that make it more challenging than everybody just being in the office. Something everybody here probably feels in some way or another. So how are you thinking about building your team in spite of those headwinds? I would say it's a huge issue. If you're listening to this, you probably run a business. And if you run a business, you're probably worried about things like paying your workers, finding good employees, or getting new customers. Maybe all of the above. To make matters worse, you can't bring these problems home to the dinner table and you can't share them with your employees. If you think you're the only one with these problems, you're wrong. Every business owner has them at one point or another. The only question is, is what you do about them. That's why I started Militia, a private network for veteran entrepreneurs and business owners. Every two weeks, we meet with eight other business owners in different industries to discuss some of the issues that you're having, learn what's working for them, 
and hear from expert speakers. It's professional development, but for you as the CEO, networking, learning, and most importantly, the relationships to help you grow to get to the next level. One member called it like having your own personal board of directors. If you're looking for other CEOs to discuss some of the problems you're having and how they're tackling them, you can join us at militiaveterans.com and apply to see if it's a good fit. Thanks so much and back to the show. It's a challenge just with any remote work. And when I think about what the role, there's two roles of a leader, right? Get the job done and retain your people. That's it. Get the job done, take care of your people. And in a remote environment, I think you have to be creative in ways that you can build a sense of team remotely. It's hard. It is way easier to go get some beers, right? It's way easier to go get some beers and everybody's a little loose and, the, and you, the boss, you leave a little bit early, you put 50 bucks on the bar tab and everybody at the end of the night knows each other. That's pretty easy to do. I think you got to be creative in a remote environment. I think you just got to be creative and nobody likes forced fun. Guys, we're going to do a digital. Like nobody likes that stuff, right? That sounds like pulling teeth. So I think a lot of times what you need to do, what I've had the most success with is find who my energizer bunnies are within my team and give it to them and then bottom up, figure out ways to do it. Like a silly example, one of our teams, they called themselves uh, from Harry Potter Gryffindor, which is the house that Harry Potter's a member of. And they call themselves the Gryffindor team. It's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, but they're excited about it. So <laughs> I gave them some money to go buy like Gryffindor scarf from Harry Potter. And now when they're on Zoom calls, they'll have the same stupid scarf on if they're having a team meeting. It's silly. It's like getting the t-shirt when you graduate the unit or whatever. It's little basic team building cohesion stuff. You got to be clever because you can't send a t-shirt to South Africa. So you got to be a little, you got to be clever about it. That'd be the first one. And the second one would be just taking the time to get to know your people as a group. We have, when we have somebody join from like a new country, we have them present to our whole company what life is like where they live. So it's actually incredible. We, some guy's a residential painter in the middle of Cleveland, and he's watching a video of someone from Kenya talking about where she lives, what food she eats, where she works. And now we created a little bit of a bond instead of it's just this person on a screen. Here's a picture of my kid. Here's what I do for fun. Surfing is big in Kenya. And now our painters actually have a relationship with the person on the other side of the screen, not just they see a name on Zoom and they're like, what the hell? But again, that's all just little chitsy tactical stuff, right? It's just getting to know people, trying to have bottom up culture stuff happen. I would generally speaking, I don't do top town mandatory fun. That doesn't work. Like the boss wants us to have a happy hour on Zoom. I'd rather jump off a bridge than do that. And I'm the boss. <laughs> like bottom up stuff. That's usually I, the best culture is developed. I don't remember one mandatory fun day in the Navy actually being fun. So. Right. I think that that red but if, pretty But hard. if all of a sudden everybody starts growing mustaches because the junior guy did and you're all making fun of them. And then the boss says, we're going to have a best mustache competition. Now that's fun because it wasn't the boss being like, we're going to be friends. So let's get some pizza. Like, but if it comes up from the bottom and everybody's growing mustaches and making fun of each other, now it's, now it actually feels like a little bit of a team instead of the old guy telling people what to do and saying, you will be friends. Nobody likes that. So again, this isn't what you guys will see as, cause my focus is global workforces and stuff like that. This is none of, this is stuff you guys have been doing forever. It's just applying it to a different domain. Nothing, none of this is like revolutionary. It's not, oh, this is the first time I've ever heard about getting to know my team. You learned that in like day two in, when you were 19. It's just you oh, being reminded of it in this context. That's all it is. But jump in there. I, I just really want to say thank you, John. I'm starting to realize that I'm the old guy now. I have the grays and I have a, a voice that you could tell I'm 40 some up. And <laughs> delegating when I was in my 20s was a lot easier. I was one of, one of the last corporal of the PFC. Yeah. But now that you're whatever title you're up there and you have to delegate, you, you really do have to, how do you say, you reiterating these things are really helping me, John. I just want to say thank you. I, I had a few minutes. I want to say thank you. I think one of the scariest moments that we've all had is when we realize we're, we're the O. Oh, shit. Nobody's having fun because I'm here. Damn. But guys, I'm fun. And you're like, if you can fire everybody, it's not fun. <laughs> all right, guys. Here's 50 bucks on the bar. 
have some beers. I'm gonna go play with my kids. Cause you realize you're the heavy now. And I'm sure you all of various stripes have had that, but that's a one. I'm sure we've all wrestled with it some more than others, which is you're not the cool yeah. or anymore. You're the freaking guy who can fire them if they get a little too drunk. Yeah. And I, just thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Cause you, like you said, you're the officer now, the heavy and you have to kind you know, how can I put it? Remember the term of conduct on becoming a Marine. You always have to remember that when, when you're about to do something, you stop. This is what I, not you. I got to yeah, take a royal you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get all, yeah, you get the, the royal we. And I have to stop. I mean, to say, okay, what would my captain do? What would a general do? And I'm starting to realize that that break in between, that space between thinking something, the mission, mm. it really does not just save your, your heart because, you know, I think we all have, you know, hypertension a little bit, uh, ergomaniacs probably all workaholic mm. here. So taking that step away really gives me another, God willing, 15 years so I can have some kids like, like Brock, knock on wood. I'll give you one, I'll give you a specific example and Dave or Chris, this might be relevant to you given that you've done some of this already. It was brought to my attention by one of my junior leaders, which was, does everybody know what Slack is? Like it's a bunch of chat rooms, more or less. It's like a group chats, right? And I was in a group chat where my team was talking and my basically head of operations came to me and said, John, we need to kick you out of the channel because they won't talk truthfully about problems if they know the boss is watching. So I got kicked out of my own company's channel because they were like, you're the boss. Doesn't matter how cool you are. Oh, they will not be honest if they know you're watching. Because I was watching. And so they kicked me out. And so I'm not in all these. And now they're actually problem solving and working with each other. And I dip my toe in every now and then. I get reports and stuff like that. But I was messing up the mojo of the group. Because, no, it's cool. I promise I won't. They're like, uh -uh. they know you're there. They see your name. And so that was when it hit me was when one of my leaders came to me and said, I got to kick you out of these channels, brother. And I was like, okay, <laughs> but I'm really excited. And they're like, nope, you got to go. And I was like, fine. So I think it's very common for all of us who try to be somewhat enlightened leaders to say, no, I'm different. But the fact is you've got a big sign on your forehead that says, I'm the boss, I'm the gray beard, I'm the heavy. And if you're not self-aware about that, your team will suffer. I, I struggle with it. So this is me sharing my own struggles as a leader. Th thank you. I, I don't mean to jump in there. I just really want to say thank you because I'm learning some things because I was grooming executives and I was, Hey, we're peers here. We're, we're all uh, equals per se. I was eliminating a hierarchy without even realizing it. And by yeah. eliminating that hierarchy, I invited chaos. The good thing was I was able to pull back because I had taken that step back for some time. Yeah, I didn't really. I can just tell, I can just tell Ron and Dwayne and Mike are sitting there being like, man, I've played this game. I can just tell, like, you guys have played versions of this game. You've seen it from both sides. You've seen it a thousand. I can just tell you, like, you guys have been down this path maybe once or twice. Ron, I would like to hear your, your input. I'm sorry, just because here no, 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 I'm learning. What are you talking about? I'm here to learn too, man. Ron, Ron ever said Ron, you look at Ron, Mike and Dwayne, and they're all next to each other. And I'm like, I bet they've done this once or twice and have some smart things to say. I so want to hear it all in a line. So yeah, whoever. I've got another question, but I'll open it up. Has anybody else got anything you want to jump in here with? So it's my, I just leave after him. It's my first time on the group as well. I'm in Longview, Texas, and I, I run a company called All Service Window Door Company and we sell all kinds of windows, doors, molding, stair part, just all kind of various things like that. But the reason I'm sitting back, John, so much just watch it is because I can relate to a whole bunch of things you're saying. And just like one, I'll say that place where you try to tear yourself and come to the same level, I've got a, a bad habit of doing that. And there, there needs to be a leader and you got to take that role up here to keep things moving and going like they should. And I appreciate the conversation. I'm telling you, I'm enjoying just leaving my mute on and listening because awesome. I think Mike, there's a, I think that, and Juan, I think said it best, which was, I think that there's maybe this modern, and you all know this, but I think that there's this modern idea that somehow equality 
is the best. And in some parts of life, equality is awesome and all that stuff. But running a business like you do, Mike, or a leader makes everyone feel better, right? Like you, you I don't know who, who's gone through medical training recently. I, I did a couple of years, you know, right before I got out, but mass casualty event, right? So a plane crashes. And what's the first thing that you're trained to do? I'm John and I'm in charge. Because everybody's running around going, the first thing you do in a mass casualty event is define the leader. It's not like, hey, let's have a vote. Should we move this guy over? The first thing you do, you pull up on a car accident and say, I'm Brock and I'm in charge. And now people go, oh, okay. Hey, hold this, put this tourniquet on, right? And so I think there is a, a modern narrative that I lose track of that I need to be reminded of that, oh, flatter's better. And we're, oh, we're friends. I happen to be the boss, but it's like, no, nah, man, I'm Mike and I'm in charge. Uh, I think we sometimes we all, I know I have to be reminded from that from time to time because it's easy to lose track of in the normal chaos of day to day and trying to make payroll. Like we all try to do in our small, that was a joke I made the other day, Brock, and then I'll go back to you, which was, I don't invest in anybody who hasn't lost a night's sleep because they were afraid they were going to make payroll. If you haven't had that feeling, you haven't gotten your stripes yet in my mind. If you've never spent the night going, shit, I could slow pay that guy and I think we should make it. Like, if you haven't done that, you're not in the club yet. Once you've done that, I'm like, okay, let's talk. But until you've done that, man, I consider you to be still on your way up. That's what I would say. So I know the first couple of times that's happened. It happens less now, thank God. But it's like a, it's a rite of passage, I think for sure. As a, I'm sure Mike's got some crazy stories from his early days, or it looks like Dave's in the laundromat wash and fold business, which is, has its own challenges. I'm sure I know a bunch of laundromat guys and not the easiest business in the world, David. Oh, sorry. I, I, I joined in late. Uh, uh, like I said earlier, I was just going to sit on the back and just figure out what this group was all about. And I'm starting to learn a little bit of your background. I guess oh. it was wash roll and laundry pickup and delivery. That was not my idea. Uh, <laughs> That was my wife's idea. She told me, hey, why don't you just start work managing Walmart? Why don't you just do your own thing? And you do a pickup on delivery bit. And you'll never go bankrupt. She first kicked me out of her laundromat because she first wanted me to use her, her laundry room and then she kicked me out. Then I started using other people's laundromats and my quality control was not there because they didn't, they didn't keep it clean or uh, the owner was upset that I was using too many dryers. Oh. My laundromat, and yeah, yeah, I'm trying to like, hey, I need to eat this lease. I need to pay my attendant. I need to pay. Oh my gosh, I'm oh. full on. I just, I got my 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 service disabled certification, but I haven't even had time to look at what could I bid on because I'm just overwhelmed. So seeing oh. folks like you that are even in the same shoes or boots as as us, it, it, it's quite refreshing, and inspiring. So I. <laughs> I think it David. was time because uh, it's, 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 a, it's a lot for me. I'll say two, two things, David. I think the first thing a group like this does is it makes you realize that this is normal. There's not something wrong with you, right? There's not something wrong with you if you're stressed about like employee quality or making payroll or the lease or whatever. Like, oh, I'm not the only one. I heard, and, and to that effect, David, I heard a great line that I love. And he said, small businesses are lightly functioning disasters that occasionally make money. <laughs> I, I, was, I was talking to Ron. I was oh, man. And I always, it made me feel normal. Now I'm like, oh, I'm not the crazy person who's wants to strangle the person on the other end of the phone or whatever, or can't get anybody to show up on time or whatever it is. So I think, I think the function of a group like this is to look around and say, hey, man, we're all imperfect. We're all working on it. We all wake up every day and put a knife between our teeth and go to it, man. And at the end of the day, we hope there's a couple bucks to pay the bills. And I think a group like this really is just like a forum where it can be like, I'm not the only crazy, because you can't tell your team about it. Your wife doesn't let you talk about business at the dinner table. You don't have many forums to, to just open up a vein and bleed. And so I think a forum like this oftentimes can do that. I'm sure that's what Brock that's a lot of what Brock does. I didn't even, you had just articulated the value of this group better than like I ever have in a year of doing this. And I didn't pay you to say that. So that's. No, I'll, give me later. Well, I'll send you an invoice. Yep. Send you an invoice. No, it's like everything that you've talked about is 
it, it's the stuff that we we talk about on a weekly basis. Hey, I'm having this problem. Who else has had this problem? What can we do about it? What do you guys suggest? Who should I talk to? Who should I hire? Who should I? It's all very normal. Just and normal, so, though. It's it, if you been in some rough situations overseas or whatever i think a lot of it too is just knowing that you're not different it's just like, oh i was the only person who thought that was completely effed up oh it's still effed up but i'm not the only one right so i think a lot of that this group functions in the same way but in a private capacity in the private sector and that's part of the value of it too is you if you want to go tout your dirty laundry and stuff online and stuff that's one thing but there's some value to be had of building some relationships with them with a small group of people that have those problems and, and people you respect. It's not some dweeb. It's people you respect. I respect what Mike's done, done. I barely know what Mike's done. I can just tell Mike's been through some shit. So when Mike weighs in on David's challenge at his, you listen, right? Want, yeah. You respect the opinion of what Juan says or what you say. It's not a bunch of amateurs because you ask the barber what to do with your business. I'll have an opinion. It's a shitty opinion. You ask Mike, Mike actually might have a, oh, do this and ask that. So I think part of the two, Brock, is that it's people who, whose experience you respect and admire, whose opinion you care about. It's not some butthead who posts on some internet forum who has no dang idea what Mike does every day. At least we know what Mike's gone through or what Juan's gone through. So I think that's part of it too, is you're like, I'm listening when Brock says something. I'm not like, this is some jerk in the comment section of a Facebook post. We've all, which we've all seen if David posted something on his Facebook. He'd get answers. They wouldn't be very good answers, right? So that's how I think about it. John, this has been killer. What what do you want to leave us with? Any high level stuff that we've missed that you think is interesting? What I would say to this group, I think is what we already said, which is all this stuff's normal. That's the first thing. And then the second thing that I would say is to attack the way your business serves you. Meaning the reason we own and build businesses is so that they serve us. We don't serve them. And if your business isn't serving you to go to work, to educate yourself about how to have your business serve you, because there are ways to build a laundromat operation. So the business serves you. There are ways to build a home improvement company so that Mike isn't getting a call at 10 PM on a Sunday night when he's in church. And so if you're not getting what you want out of your business, I would say dust off the old textbooks, ask Brock for recommendations, humble yourself and get to work. Because if your business life isn't serving you, that just means you go get smarter, attend this group every week, ask for recommendations because businesses are designed to serve their owners. They're not designed for you to say, sorry, honey, I'm a business owner. I'm always going to get calls at one in the morning. Uh, uh, it's not. And, and if you say that to yourself, I would challenge you. So I would say to go on a journey of exploration about getting better. And Brock is a great resource for this group, peers, whatever, just so that you can see that there's another level of the game. Because I've had my mind blown from time to time about, man, you're getting, God, wow, I would kill if I could do that. Teach me, right? And this group, I think, is a great way to get exposed to some of those ideas that maybe you wouldn't have seen elsewhere. They're not in the newspaper. They're in groups like this. Again, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> All right. And uh, oh, yeah, I gotta say something else. So you owe me a commission. Follow up with something derogatory. Fake yeah. my mustache isn't. Yeah, you're, you don't you don't need to care, cut your hair like that anymore. You're not in. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Grow your hair out. Okay. Cool. Well, we're, we got a couple minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody want to hit John with anything? I think so. No. Uh, if all you guys good. haven't read, if y'all haven't read E-Myth, you should, for you small business owners, read or reread E-Myth by Michael Gerber. That's a great, just, it's a great thing. To, it'd be a great discussion topic in this group, Brock, at some point, because that is a very common, it's just highly recommended. It's a great starting point for this whole kind of way of thinking. Who's the author? Yeah. I, Michael Gerber. Gerber. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll put it in the chat too. E-Myth, Michael Gerber. Very simple, but it, it definitely, you know how you read books sometimes that change your view forever? David, for you, given what you're going through right now in the state of your business, I would definitely recommend checking this out or listening to a podcast about it or watching some YouTube videos. But it would be a great discussion, Brock, for this group if everybody looks at it and then brings what they learn. 
it changed the way I think about building and buying businesses completely. So highly yeah, that's it's a good suggestion. I think we've it's been thrown around a little bit as Perfect. a good book, but uh, doing it as a small group would be fun. Perfect. It was so great to meet all of you. I'm going to put my email uh, in the chat. If you guys have any questions or need any help or need me to point you or you need certain vendors, hey, I need a good marketing guy or whatever it is, just drop me an email. I'm happy to help you out. So just, you know, I, I have a lot of little fingers and different things. So man, my, my website guy sucks. You got a web, yeah, I got a website guy. It's not going to rip you off. So if you need any of that kind of stuff, just I put my email in the, in the chat. Seriously, reach out about anything like questions, comments, whatever. Happy to help. I'll send out an email to everybody too. So don't worry about it. the chat. If you, if you want it, I'll send out John's contact info. And if you guys would like a recording of this combo, you guys can reference it later if need be. All right, guys, John, right. thank you so much. I'll stick around if anybody else wants to hang out for, for a few minutes, but appreciate your time, John. Thank you.